Today's episode is brought to you by Babel. To some, she has wandered the earth realm for thousands of years, lurking under the cover of darkness and preying on infants for which to consume. To others, she is a temptress, a wicked femme fatale, who seduces the unsuspecting man in the nocturnal hours. Some say she is a winged creature, perhaps part bird and part woman, one who possesses a horrific speech and a pair of bloody talons to boot. Meanwhile, she is also frequently dubbed as the very first woman, she who was Adam's first wife before Eve, Adam's ex-wife, if you will. Various audiences have described her as evil, innocent, immoral, brave, sickening, charming, villainous, heroic. Indeed, the character Lilith evokes many polarizing perspectives, and it would appear that throughout the generations of history, the meaning of Lilith has morphed to suit her ever-changing audiences. Despite being relatively unknown to the average follower of mainstream Christianity, and even evading the scholars of formalized demonic classifications, the ancients certainly took note of the dark powers of Lilith, and this is evident given her migration across the ancient cultures of Egypt, Greece, Israel, and of course, Babylonia. Before we get started on today's episode, a brief message from the sponsor of today's video, Babel. If you're anything like me, you've probably tried learning a new language at some point, and failed miserably. Whether it's watching videos or learning through apps, I've never been quite able to master a new language, let alone maintain the discipline to actually practice. But with Babbel, I've actually been pretty consistent, and that may be due to the fact that Babbel's lessons are designed by actual real-life language teachers, which not only makes them far more engaging and almost tailor-made for a newbie, but it also makes for a much more effective learning tool. When I've tried learning a new language, I've often been dismayed by the pretty unhelpful phrases that I've been taught. But with Babbel, you are taught practical conversations that you can actually use in the real world. All you have to do is select a language you wish to learn, choose a time for which you want to practice, and then simply put in the work. With Babbel, I've been learning Turkish, and not only is this app simple to use, but the lessons are broken down into bite-sized courses, allowing you to build your knowledge in simple steps without feeling too overwhelmed. Babbel incorporates both interactive learning by selecting the right answer to questions, but also its own speech recognition feature, allowing you to test your pronunciation. Here's me trying it out with some simple Turkish words. Adım. Adım. Balık. Balık. Kırmızı. Kırmızı. You'll also find some great games to play that help break up the monotony of traditional learning, and you can also enjoy other interactive activities to really give you the edge, including live classes with actual teachers. Learning a new language is a great goal to set for yourself, and if you missed out on your New Year's resolution, now would be the time to make up for it. Learning a new language only has positives, whether it be making new friends, advancing your career, traveling the world, or even boosting your confidence. It's also a pretty big flex, all which is possible with Babbel. Right now, Babbel are offering a massive 65% off on subscriptions. To redeem this offer, just click the link in the description box below and be on your way to mastering that new language. And now back to Lilith. In the first of this series, we'll be focusing on the Lilith from Babylonia, a woman, or perhaps more so a creature, who was vilified for her monstrous antics. Indeed, as Affa mentioned, Lilith is a polarizing character who embodies traits of bravery, courage, and a desire for emancipation, a misunderstood being who was more of a victim than a troublemaker. But to the Babylonians, it was clear who Lilith was, a fiend, a murderer, and worse yet, a demon. The origins of Lilith can be traced back to the Assyrians and the Babylonians, where the name Lilith can be found in two different forms, 
the Lili and the Lilutu. Both were believed to have meant spirits, and we see these spirits in various ancient Mesopotamian stories, where these spirits play a menacing role. According to Assyriologists, the name Lilutu can also be translated to mean female night demon, something which may mirror the understanding of an audience from the medieval period. Cuneiform scripts from Mesopotamia, meanwhile, those found on clay tablets, are believed to have referred to the Lelutu or the Lilit as an airborne spirit that carried diseases. To the ancients of the Mesopotamian regions, Lilith or the Lelutu was an undeniably nefarious creature. It was believed to dwell in the desert and prowled amongst the sandy wilderness, picking on those who were unfortunate enough to find themselves lost and alone in the dark. More specifically, the Lelutu's ideal prey happened to be pregnant women and children, arguably those who were the most vulnerable at the time. It would not be uncommon for tales of the Lelutu to have pinched infants from their families, and often enough, if a child had wandered off and gotten lost, the Lelutu would be the prime suspect. The spirit's abduction of children would become a plausible theory as to what may have happened to a lost child whilst also serving as an image or a tangible being for which to blame. Secondarily, the Lelutu could also be blamed for miscarriages and stillbirths. The Lelutu, in a plural sense, were also believed to be spiteful spirits because they had once been human themselves. They were considered to be humans who had died young, and so having been denied of their existence, became envious of the humans who were still in the land of the living. With this notion, the Lelutu became hostile and entered the households of the living so as to occupy the space of husbands and wives. There, they were able to experience what it was like to have intercourse, as well as experience the associated sensations and feelings that came with it. This would lead on to the continued vilification of these creatures, and earn them the reputation of demonic sexual predators. It is from Mesopotamian mythology that we find the earliest mention of Lilith's name in the Sumerian epic poem known as Inanna and the Halupu Tree, where she appears as the aforementioned Lilutu. In this story, we are told of Gilgamesh, a mighty hero of the ages, who with an enhanced strength and agility stands closer to the gods than any man ought to be able to. In his quest for eternal life, Gilgamesh finds himself fulfilling a favour to the goddess of love and war, Inanna, who is pining over her hulupu tree. When Gilgamesh inquires as to why the goddess is so distressed, she explains to him that she wished to carve out a throne for herself in her tree. However, three insidious beings had infiltrated the tree, a monstrous bird sat atop the branches, whilst a devilish snake burrowed beneath the tree's roots. In the centre though, lay the Lelutu, she who had made the tree her home. It is unclear why Inanna did not remove these dark essences from the tree herself, but some suggest that the Lelutu in particular possessed some power, now that it inhabited what was to become the throne of Inanna. Perhaps in some regard, this was the Lelutu preventing a goddess such as Inanna from ascending and from being recognised as a deity, or perhaps as a means for the Lelutu to demonstrate power over the goddess in that she could not be removed from her spot. On the other hand, it might be said this was just a test laid by Inanna for Gilgamesh, one he passes with flying colours. The poem tells us that not only does Gilgamesh pull the snake up from the roots, and scare the bird away, but he also terrifies the Lelutu until it flees back to the desert. From this tale alone, we can gather that the Mesopotamian attitude towards Lilith was not a favourable one. Lilith was an adversary to be overcome, an enemy of the gods, and a monster to be driven away to the desolate places outside of civilization. Like Gilgamesh, man was not meant to entertain Lilith, nor was he meant to be afraid of her, for she could be triumphed over. 
Secondarily, she was not to be admired nor yearned for, but instead banished from one's presence before she had a chance to tamper with man's better judgement. Gilgamesh in this sense becomes a portrait of how man should aspire to be, particularly in front of the gods. And because Gilgamesh had not hesitated in his shunning of Lilith, man should not have either. Yet in a Babylonian account, we find that the Lutu was believed to be a prostitute of the goddess Ishtar, Ishtar being the equivalent of Inanna. The Lutu in this sense would serve Ishtar and spread the goddess's power of sexuality throughout communities, encouraging perversion of the local men and tempting them away from their marriages. This account is corroborated with the older Sumerian accounts, where Lelutu was known as Inanna's handmaiden, where she once again was tasked with promoting promiscuity and sexual indulgence. This might be the basis as to why Lilith is often framed as a succubus, especially when you consider that she was a spirit of the night, who had a sexual appetite for men and leading them astray. The succubus functioned in exactly the same way, and whilst its primary objective was to obtain the semen of her victim, you might say it sought secondary delight in both the physical satisfaction and the corrupting of man. Furthermore, there is another Mesopotamian name recorded at this time, in the form of Lilu, which again sounds suspiciously similar to Lilith or the Lilutu itself. This creature was believed to prey on men in their sleep, and just like the succubus, sought the man's seed so as to impregnate itself. We do not get much of an idea as to what Lilith looked like from these accounts alone. However, there does exist a terracotta plaque known as the Burney Relief, that is believed to have originated from around the year 2000 before the Common Era, the same period when the epic poem Inanna and the Hilupu Tree was believed to have been written. This terracotta plaque depicts what some scholars believe to be an early Babylonian depiction of Lilutu, or Lilith, where we see her standing unashamedly naked. She is depicted with wings, talons and horns, and is accompanied by two lions and two owls, those who sit obediently beside her. The plaque itself is kind of creepy, but it does denote a sense of liberty in Lilith's nakedness, if not a total disregard of humanity and civility. In this piece, Lilith is wild and untamable. She has no need of clothes, for she is above mankind, supernatural in nature, and unsubscribing of the same virtues as us. Her attendants are creatures of the wild too, the owls and the lions, those who like the bird and the snake in the halupu tree appear to coincide with her. Interestingly, it is the owls that may mark a point of particular significance, for as a bird of prey that hunts in the night, they are certainly well suited to a nocturnal airborne spirit that the Mesopotamians pegged as Lilith. With this in mind, it is important to note that it is believed by more recent scholars that the Burney relief does not actually depict Lilith, but instead the goddess Inanna, a goddess who despite her status within the pantheon, did possess a similar sexual appetite and rogueness that is frequently attributed to Lilith. According to the Mesopotamians, another demoness in the form of Lamashtu may have been eventually conflated with Lilith and the Lelutu. Much like Lilith would become to be known, Lamashtu was said to threaten newborn babies and feasted on the flesh and blood of infants. Lilith, Lelutu and Lamashtu were not just fended off in ancient stories however. Talismans known as Arshlan Tash, amulets that were found in northwest Syria at the ancient site of Hadatu also give us an insight into how actual real life precautions were taken against night spirits. It is believed that such amulets as well as full blown tablets could be displayed in houses that were occupied by pregnant women. Their function was simple, they had ward off Lilith who had come to hunt for newborn infants or babies who were still in the womb. In some cases, it was believed that Lilith actually lurked in the doorways of a house, blocking the light from entering, much as she could be considered to block the baby 
from seeing the light of day during labour. In a time where the mortality of infants was a fragile thing, the concept of Lilith, this nocturnal demoness, provided some closure in ascertaining as to why a child had perished. In a bleak world where life quite literally hung in the balance for many families, the amulets and talismans did more than just protect against Lilith, they provided security and peace of mind. Incantation bowls were another way in which the Mesopotamians would attempt to either drive demons away from their homes or to outright capture them. These small round bowls were mostly found buried in the Middle East and are written in Jewish Babylonian Aramaic. As you can see, the bowls usually had text scrawled in a spiral, beginning from the rim and moving toward the center. These were then placed face down in the corners of homes or around cemeteries, with the hopes of trapping demons and preventing them from doing any more harm. The text found inside the bowls were usually spiritual quotes or passages from rabbinical texts, those which possessed the power to overcome a demon who had the misfortune of being caught by one of these bowls. In the case of Lilith, there exists one bowl in particular that tells us of a man named Kukwai and his family, who had been plagued by demons. The text inside this particular bowl details a request for Kukwai and his family to be released from the holds of demons, and whilst Lilith is not specifically mentioned, some scholars believe that the illustration in the centre of the ceramic is her. This is likely based on the raising of her arms to emulate aggression or malice, which is congruent with other bowls that illustrate a female demon. But this pose also matches up with the Bernie relief, which too depicts a woman with her arms raised. As we can gather, Lilith was no doubt taken seriously by the Mesopotamians, whether this be in the form of their myths or their actual day-to-day -day lives. Lilith was a very real threat, and precautions were taken to guard against such a malignant creature. There did not appear to be any savoury traits in regards to this Lilith or Lelutu thus far, and all accounts appear to be unanimous in the way she is portrayed. She adopts some of the most heinous of intentions, as she commits to child abduction and the killing of infants, and she is relegated to being a most despicable being in her desire to harm the vulnerable. Yet she was also believed to be a seducer of men, robbing them of their virtues and righteousness by stirring them from their sleep and fornicating with them. But whilst we can gather that the Mesopotamians were not her biggest fans, in the next episode, we'll be looking at what the Bible says about her and what sort of image is evoked by both traditional Catholicism and Christian Apocrypha. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.